Intel's newest generation of CPUs are almost here, and they've changed an awful lot, including the damn names, so let's start there. These new chips aren't the 15th generation of Intel's Core i series of chips, these are the Core Ultra 200 series, specifically the Core Ultra 9 to 85K, Core Ultra 7 to 65K, and Core Ultra 5 to 45K, along with KF SKUs of the 5 and 7 chips. Don't ask why these are canonically the second generation of Core Ultra chips, although if you'll permit me to be a pedant for just a moment, Intel has had a pretty consistent naming scheme for oh, two decades now, give or take. The second number donate, uh, denotes the class. A uh, 14600K is a 600 class chip. A 14900K is a 900 class chip. That class structure has been pretty consistent too. So to have that shifted down a step, so an 85 class chip is an i9, sorry, but an Ultra 9, and a 65 is an Ultra 7, Nah mate. Anyway, the, the naming is the least of our concerns. The chips themselves are new too. Here's the spec list. The 285K is a 24 core made up of 8 Lion Co performance cores and 16 Skymont efficiency cores. And if you want to know more about those cores or why these chips no longer have hyper threading, check out my full explainer video already live on the channel. I'll be in the cards above for you. The 265K keeps the same 8P cores, but has just four less E cores, making it a 20 core part, and the 245K drops a further four E cores and two P cores for a total of six plus eight, or 14 all in. Interestingly, there's no mention of the LPE cores found in Lunar Lake, so this is quite a different SOC tell from that. The big story here, by far, at least the one that Intel's pushing, is all about power. And not the performance kind, I mean the from the wall kind. These Arrow Lake CPUs are meant to be significantly more efficient, like the same performance at half the power of Raptor Lake. They do say that they should be faster at you know, full power, but that's merely a byproduct of the increased efficiency, at least it seems. They aren't even claiming performance in gaming leadership. Even compared to their own last gen parts, they say that you'll get a fraction less performance albeit at a considerable power drop. 264 FPS uh, versus 261, but 80 watts less power on the 285K versus a 14900K. In fact, looking at the 14 game chart, the majority of games listed are listed as on par, with the real takeaway being that some games experience considerably less power draw on the newer part. They even claim, at least on what I have to imagine are the 7 best games for this point, that you can drop the power limit from the stock 250 watts all the way down to 125 watts and not lose any performance. Of course, for some titles that won't be the case. Something like Rainbow Six Siege, which is included in their 7 game list, really isn't an all core workload, and so dropping the power limits to even half of the stock limit just means that you don't have as much headroom for other stuff in the background, but the game itself won't be affected. Compare that to something like, I don't know, Cyberpunk, which is a fair bit more intensive, and you might find that a lower power limit will actually hurt performance. Of course, with that lower power draw, you do get a corresponding temperature drop. Intel is claiming a whopping 13 degrees Celsius drop on average compared to the 14900K, at least while gaming anyway. Of course, for all core workloads, both of those chips can suck back 250 watts, so there isn't likely to be much thermal difference uh, you know, in all core workloads. The efficiency isn't the only new thing though, and there are some really interesting gems hidden here, so let me start digging. The chips themselves are the tiled designs that first launched with Meteor Lake last year, but this is the first time we've seen them come to the desktop market. Long story short, and check out my video on Meteor Lake uh, if you want to have the long story, these chips are made up of smaller tiles, similar to AMD's chiplet design, that's actually unlike AMD, is bonded to another sort of mother tile, the base tile as Intel calls it. 
The tiles are the compute tile with all of your cores and cache, the I.O. tile where things like PCIe connect, the SOC tile where you find the memory controller, the MPU and more, and in this case the GPU tile too. Those tiles, or well, actually all but the base tile, are actually made by TSMC. The compute tile is TSMC's N3B process node, the GPU tile is N5P, and the SOC and I.O. tiles are N6 which is a really big deal. Intel not using their own process nodes, even for the compute tile, is huge. Something that isn't huge though, is the chips themselves. They're now 33% smaller, which might explain why we need a whole new socket and chipset to go along with these. This will be LGA 1851, which is kind of interesting because that means more pins, up from 1700 with the 12, 13, and 14th gen chips, and Z890 motherboards. That chipset is actually pretty huge. It has Wi-Fi built in, specifically Wi-Fi 6E, meaning all motherboards should be Wi-Fi boards, with the option of upgraded Wi-Fi 7 available, plus Bluetooth is built in too. It even has a 1 gig NIC built in, which is fantastic, and of course the option for 2.5 or higher NICs as well. You've got 8 SATA ports built in, 14 USB 2, 10 USB 3.2, and 24 PCIe lanes from the chipset. The CPU itself has 20 PCIe Gen 5 lanes on board, with the usual 16 to 4 split for GPUs and an SSD, plus a Gen 4 link to the chipset. I should mention that there's actually some new details about the cores themselves too. The layout of the compute tile has changed, as the E cores are now sort of intermingled with the P cores, which Intel says is to help with hotspots and heat dissipation. Basically, by spreading the hot P cores around and putting the E cores in the middle, you should get sort of more even temperatures and less hotspots. Sweet. The big change to the architecture, though, is that the L3 cache is now shared not only between all the available P cores, but the E core clusters too. This should help speed up the core to core task switching that we know these chips do an awful lot thanks to that hybrid design. They also get an L2 cache bump, especially on the P cores, from 2 megabytes to 3 megabytes per core. Nowhere near AMD's 3D V cache levels, of course, but more does seem to be more better. Earlier I mentioned the uh, SOC tile has an NPU, that's a neural processing unit, aka an AI accelerator. Although it is worth noting that this isn't the newest version of Intel's NPU that they include on the mobile-only Lunar Lake chips. This is the now old NPU 3 from Meteor Lake, which is a 13 tops design, meaning it doesn't meet Microsoft's 40 tops requirement for Copilot Plus. They said in the, the Q&A uh, for the, the press briefing that this was a deliberate choice, purely based on the available die space. They could have fit the newer NPU 4 in, which I think offers 48 tops, but then they might have had to cut, say, the integrated GPU, which on these non fsqs anyway, are, is a quad-core part, it's the, the new design, and they were pretty proud of the built-in media engine that that has and quick sync for creators. So they opted for the older and considerably less powerful NPU3 instead. They did also talk about overclocking these things. The biggest topic was memory, which actually has a pretty major change that you'll be hearing more about, including from me pretty soon, which is CU dims. That being clock driver unbuffered dims. Basically, these memory modules have a clock driver chip built onto them that redrives the signal from the memory controller, which basically makes higher speeds considerably more stable. And according to Intel anyway, 8,000 megatransfers per second is the new sweet spot for overclocked memory. The new base standard, as, the, as in the sort of max speed that won't void your warranty, is now DDR5-6400, although for anything higher than that, you'll likely want a CU DIMM module to get the, that stability benefit. Oh, and before you get your hopes up, uh, Intel mentioned that the ECC support uh, that's included in this slide is for the workstation parts, not just the regular gaming parts, which is definitely a shame. As for overclocking the chips themselves, 
Well, they mentioned that, at least in the Lunar Lake video, that they've made the, the core clock more granular at 16.67 uh, megahertz uh, steps rather than 100 megahertz, so you can more finely control the, the frequency just to eke out that last little bit of performance that might be available. The chips now also have dual base clocks, one for the SOC tile and one for the compute tile, so you can OC sort of each independently, which is pretty handy. They were pretty clear though that the memory overclocking is likely where it's at, along with E-core overclocking, as the P-cores are really already running at the, at the limit, and so you likely won't get too much out of them there. And finally, we have pricing. I'll stick the slide on the screen so that you can just see them all, but in short, they're pretty much the same as the 14th gen parts, at least at MSRP. As of writing this, all of the 14th gen chips seem to be on sale often at a pretty considerable discount compared to MSRP. For example, the 14900K is over $100 off the MSRP at $469, and the 14600K is at $259, making it a decent bit cheaper than the 245K. But we will have to wait until later this month to run our own tests and see how these new chips stack up and if, we, if, if it will be worth splashing out over the 14th gen and over Ryzen, especially with the new X3D chips on the Horizon 2. So that's what's new with Arrow Lake. We will be having some uh, full reviews towards the end of the month, so make sure you're subscribed for those. But I would love to hear your thoughts so far. What do you think of these new chips? The new naming scheme, the new core structure, the new lack of hyper-threading, the AI accelerators, the memory overclocking, all that sort of stuff. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Like I said, if you want to see the full reviews when they are uh, legally allowed to be released, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out plenty of other videos, including the other Tech Explained videos on Meteor Lake and Lunar Arrow Lake. They'll be on the end cards. And uh, yeah, otherwise, feel free to check out links in the description. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you on the next video.